I'm ready to get started? Okay, uh, good evening everyone. Uh, my name is Richard Randall and I uh, want to welcome you here tonight and I, I want to thank the Center for Wooden Boats for the opportunity of being here uh, to talk about uh, stewardship, a uh, very important part of owning um, old uh, cruisers like this one that you see on the screen. Um, this is the uh, compadre, she's uh, 1929 Stevens, she's 43 feet overall, and um, we've owned her since 2007. Can everybody hear me okay? Good. Um, she's here tonight along with two other boats from the Classic Yacht Association, and we're all moored um, over along the uh, north wall, uh, just a adjacent to the, uh, to the museum. And uh, the boats will be open um, to a tour uh, as soon as we're finished here tonight, until it gets dark or until nobody else comes. And, um, <laughs> and I'd encourage you to come down, uh, have a look around, talk to the other owners, and get a feel for, for what this is all about. But it's safe to say that none of these boats would be here tonight if it weren't for the stewardship of many, many um, previous owners. And when we talk about stewardship, we talk about flipping the screen to the next one. <laughs> okay, too far. Oh. <laughs> okay, so we're getting a feel for it. Okay, uh, s stewardship in general. Stewardship in general is, um, you can think of it as taking care of something. It's the simplest sort of explanation. It's often something of value. Um, usually it's something that's been in entrusted to you. And in the context of wooden boats, you might think that, well, this is all about making sure that your varnish is in good shape and your, your um, frames are not all rotten. But um, I hope tonight to show that, that stewardship is a lot more than just uh, paint and varnish and um, planks and frames. Okay, so um, stewardship in classic cruisers. Uh, the goal of this, obviously, is to uh, preserve these vessels so that we can pass them on, hopefully in better shape than when we um, receive them uh, to, uh, to future owners and literally to future generations. And I like to think of stewardship in two parts. Um, there are what I call the elements of stewardship, which um, these are the things that we do. These are the actions that we take as, as um, boat owners. But um, there's a bigger area that I call the foundations of stewardship, which uh, is really all about why we do this at all. You know, what, what motivates us to own these vessels to begin with. So we'll talk about the elements of stewardship first. In some ways, that's the easiest part and the part that you're most familiar with. Um, a lot of that has to do with maintenance and repair and occasionally restoration, hopefully not too much of that. Um, it also involves uh, researching the history of these vessels as well as the history of the builders. And finally, um, there's a important part that has to do with education and outreach. And, and in a selfish sense, that's all about finding the next owner. But of course, if there aren't any people interested coming along after us, uh, these won't, boats won't continue to survive. So we'll talk about the maintenance and the repair part just a little bit, um, because again, I'm sure you're familiar with that. And some of you have done way more than you'd like to do. Um, but I have to say, uh, on my boat anyway, uh, most of the time I spend working on it has nothing to do with the fact that it's a wooden boat. Um, there's just normal boat things that any boat of any age would have, like working on the engine, uh, fiddling with the electrical system, working on the electronics, uh, fiddling with the plumbing, trying to get the bilge pumps to work properly, um, working on the refrigeration, uh, the uh, heating system, the list goes on, and uh, you would have those kinds of maintenance issues r regardless of the age of your boat. And there are obviously wooden boat things as well. Uh, our boat has a lot of bright work on it, a lot of, a lot of varnish that needs to be maintained, but um, that's a manageable job. I like to varnish, and so I guess that's a good thing. Um, occasionally there's painting to do, but paint holds up much better than varnish, and so there's, that's not as often. Um, infrequently, there's wood repair that actually needs to be done. Often water finds its way into places where it doesn't belong, and you need to fix that. Um, hopefully that's not a big deal. But all of that can be minimized if you, if you have covered moorage, and that's really the key. Okay, uh, restoration we'll say a little bit more about. Um, 
uh, restoration, fortunately, is not a frequent event. Uh, but when it happens, it's expensive. And it's important to note that it's, um, when, it, when you need it, you really need it. It's essential. Otherwise, um, you know, these boats will um, eventually just disintegrate. Um, usually, a restoration project has something to do with the hull and deck structure. Okay, um, I'll just run through a little bit of a history of, um, of this repair job uh, that we did, a small restoration job, if you will, back in 2010 on the Compadre. This is the way the bow area looked when we bought the boat. You can see a lot of discoloration here along the stem, uh, lots of rust. Um, you can see that this, this big frame here is rotted out completely before it actually reaches the floor timber, and we got this little tiny um, uh, sister that somebody's put in there, probably so small that it doesn't actually do anything. And uh, we, we worked with this for three years and decided um, at that point that it was time to get into it and find out um, how serious it was and take care of what needed to be done. And so um, here we are up at Port Townsend, uh, wrecking out the garboard planks, uh, just having a look at what's inside, um, kind of assessing uh, what we need to do, and uh, this all looks a lot more dramatic than it really is. These people up there are very skilled. Uh, in the end, we ended up uh, with uh, 13 uh, pairs of, of frames sistered and, um, and 13 of their associated floor timbers. And um, you can see that we're part way through installing the frames here. And um, here's Aaron Day, the shipwright, uh, just ferrying in some of the new frames. And um, putting on the garboard plank when we're finished. And six weeks later, we were ready to go again with new paint on the top sides and new bottom paint and uh, lots of smiling faces. So that's a kind of a typical job that you might have to face um, maybe once every 10 years. Every, you, could, you could own a boat for 10 or 15 years and not have to do that if you're lucky. But it, it is infrequent, but unfortunately it is expensive. Okay. Um, this is a good point to kind of pause and note that, um, that it takes a village to do this. Uh, we really can't do uh, a proper job of maintaining and restoring these boats on our own. And so we're relying on the, 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 the skill of, of lots of craftspeople. We're very fortunate to have people like Haven Boat Works, uh, Port Townsend Shipwrights Co-op, and many, many smaller shops all around the Salish Sea area that it, you know, where the uh, people that are very talented and, and perfectly capable of tackling projects like this. Okay, uh, one of the other very important parts of stewardship is researching and preserving the history of these boats and, and the, the history of the, the people who built them. And um, in terms of boat history, vessel history, you might be interested in things like the year it was built or the designer, um, who the original owner was, um, what the ownership history has been. And you'll see that we've had lots of owners of our boat. Um, where the boat's been during its life, um, what events might have taken place during that time, um, photographs of, of um, the boat uh, and its surroundings are, are really nice if you, if you happen to have them. Um, similarly with plans and documents. And even um, information about cl old club affiliations can be useful when you're tracking things down. Um, in terms of Compadre, as I said earlier, uh, she was built by the Stevens brothers down in Stockton, California. And she was launched in April of 1929, and her original owner was Mr. Leland Adams from San Francisco. Uh, Mr. Adams was a wealthy mining engineer, and at the time he was a vice president of Leslie Salt Company. And um, it's interesting to note that we've had 13, at least 13 later owners. Um, these are the, those are the owners that we know about, and there was a 20-year period that isn't documented, and I'm sure there were other owners during that time. So um, the more owners you have of these vessels, the more likely it is that they won't survive. And so we were very fortunate to have Compadre come through all of this. Um, her location history is interesting. She was built in 29, as I said, uh, stayed in San Francisco Bay Area until 1937. And, and then she went down the coast to Los Angeles and um, Long Beach and San Diego, and she was down there until the mid-60s. And in 1966, she surfaces again in San Francisco Bay, uh, up in, um, in Marin County. And she was there um, until 2007 when we uh, purchased her up on the Napa River. <coughs> Excuse me, put her on a trailer 
and, uh, and uh, had her hauled uh, up here to Puget Sound. Uh, it's important to note that uh, in terms of events, um, the boat was extensively restored in the 1980s. Uh, I was told by one previous owner that she was, quote, brought back from the dead. And um, we can look through the boat and see evidence of where that work took place. Uh, we're very fortunate to have this picture of the original owner, Leland D. Adams. This was taken from a, in a um, uh, passport photo of him uh, eight years before he, he bought the compadre. And uh, we have this picture. Uh, unfortunately, it's the only one we have, an uh, old picture of compadre. Um, but here she is underway um, around 1930. We're not sure of the circumstances here, but she's going very fast. As you can see, the bow is way out of the water. And um, there's a big levee in the background. And so I think this is probably up in the Sacramento River Delta, uh, very near where she was launched. And uh, you can see that the, uh, the uh, handrail stanchions here are all, uh, they're bronze. And so they're all very nicely shined. Um, so this may very well be the uh, sea trials when it was first launched. But you know, we, we just really don't know. But anytime when you can get photographs like this, you're, you're very fortunate. Okay, and we are lucky to have um, at least some of the, um, of the original drawing. Um, we have uh, this sheet here which shows the profile and, and the deck plan. And um, in the history of the builder and designer is always a very interesting thing. In the, in the case of um, Stevens Brothers, we know quite a lot about that, and that could be, a, could be a whole talk in itself, which we won't go into tonight. But it's important to note the dates of production um, the number of boats that they built. Uh, some of these builders built just a few boats. Some of them built thousands. Um, the types of vessels that they built, uh, materials that they used, and, and something about the background and training of the people involved. Um, people today are surprised to learn that uh, a lot of the, uh, the owners of these old companies uh, had no formal training in yacht design or marine architecture or anything like that. They learned as they went along. Um, and uh, it's good to know um, where uh, there might be uh, records from the company that are still available. In our case, there's a museum in Stockton that has all of the records of the Stevens Brothers. So in, uh, so in terms of the Stevens Brothers themselves, uh, they started building vessels in 1905 and uh, for, um, for farmers to take their produce to market in San Francisco. And shortly they began to build pleasure boats. And you can see this boat here from 1925, juxtaposed against a much, much newer one built in 1982. Now these are very typical of the boats that they built. By the time they got into the 80s, they were building boats out of aluminum. So this is a huge aluminum yacht. They never built any fiberglass boats. Uh, Stevens Yard was a big deal uh, in Stockton. Um, these buildings are still there. They're just used for, one of them is used for boat storage actually. Okay, um, here's an interesting picture of the inside of the, one of the shops there uh, around 1930. And you can see in the background here, there's, whoops, um, there's a, uh, look, I think it's a 43 footer that's just about finished. And in the foreground, there's a much larger boat, probably 55 or 60 feet that's just partly going. And there's another one way over here in the corner that's partly planked. Um, they had a lot going on at any one time. Um, and the final, the final um, uh, part of this uh, is education and public awareness, um, part of what we're doing here tonight. Um, this is very important in terms of, um, uh, of continuing the, you know, the, um, the life of these vessels. Um, and it, uh, we found that public awareness really begins at the dock. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that uh, almost wherever we pull into the dock, there are people that come by the boat and say, you know, my grandfather had a boat just like this, or my uncle used to work at the Stevens Yard, or any number of other things. It's very common, and it's amazing how much attention these boats draw. Um, classic boat festivals are an important way of getting the word out. This is a picture of the uh, Bell Harbor Classic Rendezvous Classic Weekend. It happens in June on Father's Day weekend every year. Uh, it's open to the public. Uh, we take over the entire Bell Harbor Marina. Uh, it's a great way to come down, um, learn more about these boats, get to know the owners, and um, it, you might even find yourself being an owner. <coughs> um, that's, that's how we got started, actually. 
Okay, uh, educational organizations. Being active and supporting educational organizations are a real important part of this. Uh, support for the Center for Wooden Boats, for example, or the Northwest Maritime Academy in Port Townsend. Uh, the Northwest School of Wooden Boat Building is where a lot of the craftspeople that we use today were trained. And there's um, a bunch of museums throughout the Salish Sea area that are working to uh, maintain our maritime heritage. Um, owners' organizations are also important. Uh, most of the owners of um, big craft like ours, cruisers like ours, would belong to the Classic Yacht Association. Owners of smaller boats, uh, and particularly uh, these beautiful mahogany runabouts, uh, would typically belong to the Antique and Classic Boat Society. Um, the Classic Yacht Association um, is uh, dedicated to the promotion, preservation, and restoration of fine old motor-driven craft. Um, we have over 300 members uh, divided into five fleets uh, in the United States. Uh, there's one in Canada. Uh, and we also have some, a few uh, owners in Europe. Uh, we're an educational nonprofit, and uh, we have a big website at classicyachtassociation.org with lots of information. Uh, I'd encourage you just to go there and, and have a quick look. Uh, so that's really what I call the elements of stewardship. It's the maintenance, repair, and restoration. It's the researching and preserving the history of these boats and their owners or their builders. And, um, and engaging in um, some education and outreach. So th the other question is, what's, what's behind all this? What, what is it that drives this sense of stewardship? And um, I can tell you that it's not an interest in conservation and restoration. That's not why most people buy these boats. Occasionally, you'll find somebody who just likes to build stuff, but that's very unusual. Um, we, uh, we, buy, we own them for different reasons. <coughs> so why do we own and, and care for these boats? And another way to ask that question is why would you own the Josephine, this 1947 Blanchard, when you could just as own <coughs> soon own um, a nice Ranger Tug? Oh my God. Well, it's interesting to note that uh, you would spend about the same amount of money if you owned either one of these boats over a 10 or 15 year period, the, the, the out-of-pocket cost would be almost the same. So the reason that we own these boats and not own the other ones, uh, it doesn't have much to do with cost. Okay, um, another question to ask, why own the Scandalon, 1953 Chris Craft in beautiful condition, when you could just as easily own the North Pacific Trawler? Uh, a friend of mine owns one of these boats, a great boat, he's taken it back and forth to Alaska twice, um, you know, very comfortable. So, so what's going on here? And I think it can be explained by what we see here on the screen. Uh, I, what I call the foundations of stewardship. Um, it starts with a respect for the design and craftsmanship that goes into these boats. Um, it, it does include a lot of uh, interest in history as we've already discussed. Um, pride of ownership is a big part of this. Um, there are joys uh, of owning these classic boats and cruising them that you don't find in um, being aboard uh, more modern boats. There's something special about them. <coughs> and finally, uh, there's a social part. Uh, the, the fellowship of, that we share with um, other um, owners of these classic boats is very important. Yes, <laughs> other, other owners that may have the same disease. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so let's talk a little bit about respect for design and craftsmanship. I think this is one of the most important, uh, one of the most interesting parts of owning these old boats. And to do that, we're, we'll just take a brief tour. And we're gonna start before 1920. Uh, this is when uh, power boats were just beginning to come into their own. Um, there was still a very strong sailboat influence, in both in terms of their hull shape and also their interior layout. And uh, you'll see that most of these boats in the, that area were double-ended. And a really good example would be the Rheingold built in 1911 uh, up in Vancouver. And you can see, if you, if you were to remove this little superstructure back here, you'd have a perfectly good sailboat hull. Okay, uh, similarly with the Glenifer. Um, she was built in Hong Kong, but she's um, up here in British Columbia now. And, um, whoops. And finally, the, uh, the Glory B. Um, she was built by Taylor and Grandy um, here on Lake Union. Um, again, a very strong sailboat influences, especially if you think about what it would look like without that uh, little house in the back. Incidentally, all of these boats that I have as examples are here in the Pacific Northwest. 
Uh, when we get to 1920 um, and uh, into the 30s, we, f we get into, we see boats that were designed consciously as power boats. Uh, you, you, we've left the uh, uh, influence of sailboats behind. We see very strong vertical design elements. Um, usually that's typified by a plumb bow. Um, the Emmeline, built in 1928, Lake Union, dry dock boat, um, is a really great example. And you can see all these vertical design elements there. Um, there's not a curve in sight. Well, there's one tiny curve. Um, uh, the Lake Union Dreamboats are another great example where, again, very strong um, vertical influences. We're fortunate to have several beautiful dreamboats um, still remaining here in the, in the Seattle area. Um, Winifred is one. Um, Marion II is another. Um, Turning Point, which is one of the boats that was going to be here tonight, is another. Unfortunately, they were, they were both sick, but uh, we'll get by. Uh, Merva is a really interesting little boat um, built up in Esquimalt Harbor in British Columbia in 1932. Um, and you can still that see that she still has um, you know, quite a lot of um, vertical design elements, although interestingly she, she does have a, a canoe stern. So um, there's, um, there's a lot of uh, variation and overlap in these designs. Okay. By the time we get into the 30s, things begin to change even more. We see fewer vertical elements, design elements. Um, bows are angled, as are the windscreens or windshields, the front of the wheelhouses. And we even begin to see some curves. Um, Patamar is a good example of what you'd see in a 1930s boat. Um, you can see that um, you know, the, the windshield is raked back here now. The bow is not quite plumb anymore. You have these little curves here at the aft end of the wheelhouse and bigger curves here back by the cockpit combing. So quite different uh, from the earlier boats. Whoops. Okay, uh, similarly with Pied Piper. Um, uh, still kind of angular, but uh, with curves in the, in the, um, the overhang there uh, above the cockpit and um, quite different from the bridge deck cruisers that we saw in the earlier pictures. And of course, Marini, um, this beautiful Chris craft built in 1940, is, uh, is e even farther evolved in, in terms of, of design. Uh, you can see all these curves, especially this, this amazing uh, curved window here in the aft cabin. So, so that is, um, that's into the 40s. And when you get into the post-war years and up into the 50s, um, things really start changing. Uh, curves at this point really dominate and uh, sometimes you would actually call these boats streamlined. And a uh, good example would be Zanzibar. Uh, she's a, another Stevens Brothers boat. This one built in 1957. But uh, you can see um, this, this swooping curve that starts here in the cabin and the, the house here and, and comes all the way back to the transom. Um, that's very typical of boats that you see in the 1950s. But um, the, the best example that I've come up with <coughs> is um, these Shane airflow trimmer ships um, that were built uh, in the 40s. And this one is the Forevermore. Um, she's here on Lake Union, um, built in 1945. And uh, this curved bow is remarkable. But even more so is this, uh, is this profile that, that it starts here at the center of the wheelhouse and just sweeps back, not just to the transom, but all the way down to the water line. So just really extravagant. Okay, 1960s, the pendulum swings back again and we'll see a return to more angular lines. And a good example would be the Aloha, um, a beautifully restored Owens. And you can see um, lots more angular elements here again. Uh, and this carried through this sort of style carried through until the, um, until the late 60s when wooden boats pretty much stopped being built. Whoops, 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 whoops. Let's get back here. So that's a very quick and very generalized tour of, of um, how boat design has evolved, um, the design of these cruising boats has evolved over the years. And it's one of the most interesting things, I think, uh, uh, when it comes to um, these old classic boats. Um, an important part, as I said earlier, of, of the stewardship business is this pride of ownership. And you know, we see pride of ownership in, in any, any boat, or at least we should. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't always shine through. But um, uh, 
with, with this, it's usually the little things that your eye is drawn to. And um, just, you know, having flowers in the wheelhouse when you're out there in the summertime or um, just the details of this footrest or, or um, this, this is an air vent, air, air intake vent on the deck of a boat that I can't recall. Uh, it's one of the boats that's here locally. Uh, but I just love the design of this and um, the craftsmanship that obviously went into it and the pride that the owner takes in keeping it in this kind of shape. Um, I love the, uh, this old Art Deco lamp that's uh, in the cabin of Valonius. Um, some people in the audience here will recognize that. Um, I also like these beautiful uh, lace curtains in the, um, in the windows of the Omaha. She's a 1926 bridge deck cruiser, a big boat. Uh, built by Martinac down in Tacoma. And, and uh, talk about attention to detail. Uh, the uh, helm station here on Marigny uh, uh, is, is certainly very impressive and it kind of just shouts uh, pride of ownership, um, as does the interior of the Marigny and to the, um, this beautiful uh, stateroom. Um, just um, just stunning. So as I said, I, pride of ownership is um, something you'd, you hope to see in most boats, but I think on these classic boats, it's perhaps just a bit more so. As I said earlier, there's a certain joy of being on these boats, of owning them, being aboard, that you really uh, can't um, replicate in, in newer boats. And so I hope to show some of that here in the time I have remaining. Um, We'll talk about life aboard. So again, uh, welcome aboard. Um, this is a really great picture uh, of the interior of Marion II. Um, and I show this. By Greg Gilbert. <laughs> photo by Greg Gilbert, yes. Uh, photographer for the Seattle Times. Um, I show this because, not partly because it's a beautiful picture, but partly because I, I know um, owners of modern boats that say that they own them because they want to be comfortable when they go out and cruise. Well, uh, I'd like to show them this picture. Uh, and this one too, uh, the, uh, this very comfortable um, stateroom on Marigny, the 1940 Chris Craft that you saw earlier. Uh, it's simple but elegant and um, very comfortable. Um, this is the stateroom on our boat, the Compadre. And um, again, these, these old boats have a certain sort of elegant simplicity about them that you just don't, uh, you just don't find on modern boats. And uh, this is our wheelhouse. And again, it's uh, simple, but there's really good visibility and it's comfortable. And we have a functioning galley that you can actually cook in. And, um, and it, it's fun just to be aboard these boats. And sometimes, you know, sometimes the joy of owning them is just taking your turn at the wheel on a sunny day or, um, or relaxing in a cozy cabin after dark or um, <laughs> perhaps having lunch out on the back deck, you know, on a sunny day with a glass of wine. Um, or just sitting out a rainy day in the San Juan can be, can be enjoyable in its, in its own right. So the joys of owning these things, uh, to me, um, really comes through uh, during, during cruising, cruising season. We, we bought Compadre not as a showpiece, but to, to have a cruising boat that we would be proud to own. And I've got some pictures of cruising here that I want to share with you. Um, where are we going today? Well, the answer, of course, is sometimes it really doesn't matter. Um, we're, I think we're southbound here through. Um, through Sansom Narrows up in the, up in the Gulf Islands. Um, some people just cruise between marinas. I mean, you can go near and far and do that and um, have a perfectly good time. Here we are down at Quartermaster Harbor uh, on Vashon. Um, but we like to um, anchor out in a little quiet cove somewhere. Here we're at Jones Island. Uh, and you don't have to go far. Um, this picture's down in uh, Anderson Island down in the South Sound, just a four-hour run from where we keep the boat. But if you want to go far, there, 
um, it, it can be really magical. This is one of my favorite places. This is um, going up Toba Inlet in uh, Desolation Sound. And this is one of the most beautiful and wild places that you can easily get to in a boat. I mean, it's just hard to describe with these uh, uh, high mountain peaks just plunging right down into the water. Um, most people, when they cruise here from the Seattle area, end up in the San Juan Islands, and some of you are familiar with where that is. Um, we like to go to Susha Island. Um, it's a, the whole island is a state park, and if you went, if you only went to one island in the San Juans, um, Susha would be the one I would go to. There's several really nice anchorages, and uh, it's big enough so that it's never very crowded. You all might also want to go to Stewart Island. Uh, Prevost Harbor is, is a great place. You can take the dinghy to shore, uh, walk up this road to the right, and that takes you out to the Turn Point Lighthouse where you can stand on the bluff overlooking the water. And on two occasions now, we've seen a um, big school of orcas just cruise right on by. So it's really a spectacular spot. And it's rare that we go to the San Juans without taking the hike out here. Uh, if you want to go farther, um, the Gulf Islands are an easy place to go. And um, again, this is that same picture I showed a moment ago, just southbound uh, towards Sansom Narrows with um, Salt Spring Island on the left there and um, Vancouver Island on the right. Um, uh, Princess Cove on Wallace Island is a really neat spot. It's a very long and narrow little inlet and people drop their anchors in the middle of the inlet and uh, stern tide ashore. Uh, the whole island is a provincial park, a great place to get out and hike around. Uh, if you're up there on a really crowded weekend, a great place to go is Montague Harbor on Gabriola Island because it's big and I've been here with 100 boats and um, it, it doesn't seem crowded. So it's a really great location. Um, if you do want to go farther yet, it's fairly easy to get to Desolation Sound up at the north end of um, the Straits of Georgia. You have to kind of time your passage across the strait and that sort of thing. but. Um, Again, it's just a spectacular area with these high mountain peaks and um, lots of little um, coves and inlets to anchor in. This is <coughs> perhaps the most popular cove up there, Credo Haven. Um, this is in May, and you'll notice people that have been here before will notice that there aren't very many boats here. <laughs> we had seven boats that evening. Um, if you were to come back in July or August, there would be 40 or 50, something like that. A very, very different experience. And um, it is possible to be all by yourself up here, which is really kind of a special experience. Um, we often see quite a bit of wildlife when we're tucked away in a little cove like this where we're the only boat. And of course, um, you can go farther north all the way to Alaska. And this was taken <laughs> from the wheelhouse of Thelonious, whose owners are here tonight, and boat is tied up down at the dock. Um, yeah. It, it, these. Um, these trips up here are well within the reach of these old classic boats. Um, I want to finish up um, with this business of um, the foundations of stewardship by talking about fellowship and community because this is the part that doesn't get talked about very often. Um, and we really need to acknowledge that this is not all about the boats. There's um, a, a lot of enjoyment to be had by uh, just sharing this experience with other folks. And here we are all milling around, uh, um, getting ready for, uh, for the parade on opening day here in Seattle. Um, we often gather with a bunch of our closest friends um, in these events like you see here, this is the uh, Wooden Boat uh, Festival up in Vancouver. I mean, I'm sorry, Vancouver Island, uh, Victoria. Uh, happens every September. Um, and uh, it's a great way to get together and uh, meet people with uh, common interests. Um, but sometimes we just get together with small groups. And here we are with a small group of people um, uh, out at Manzanita Bay on uh, Bainbridge Island. Um, whenever you get together on the, uh, with other classic boat owners, there's always things to talk about, uh, whether you're on the dock or not. Uh, you know, who did your engine work? Um, <laughs> where did you get that transom replacement? <laughs> <laughs> all kinds of things like that. Uh, I have to admit that food is often involved in, the, in this stuff, so uh, we're no different from other boaters in that regard. Uh, you might be lucky enough to be invited to a, uh, to a birthday party on the Compadre. Uh, this was up in 
in uh, Princess Louisa Inlet about 10 years ago. And I don't remember whose birthday it was, but I can assure you we had a very good time. But you don't have to get together with a big group of people. Sometimes it's, it's enough just to sit on the back deck um, with uh, a good friend and, uh, and a beer and just to enjoy the sunshine. So uh, why, do we, uh, why do we own these classic cruisers? Why do we go through this stewardship business? Well, um, the short answer is it's a lot of fun, and it's a unique and, and very practical way to cruise. So um, this is um, kind of in summary here. Um, I hope I've shown that stewardship is more than just planks and frames. Um, it's about maintenance and repair, of course. Um, it, but it, and it's also about preserving the history of these boats and engaging in, in outreach and education. But all of this floats upon this, this uh, lower part here of a broader part of uh, respect for design and craftsmanship and um, an interest in history, um, pride of ownership, uh, the unique joys of being aboard these boats and owning them and cruising them, and also enjoying the, the fellowship of, of um, fellow owners. So that's all I have for you tonight. Uh, I do want to invite you to visit us down on the dock afterwards. Um, we'd be very happy to show you around and to talk about um, um, the joys of owning these boats. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs> questions? Um, Yeah, the question, uh, this is being um, uh, videoed. So the question was, um, on that earlier picture I showed, the old picture of the boat, um, uh, wh uh, why was the bow so high out of the water? Wow. And uh, it's because uh, it was being pushed very hard. And if you know about displacement hulls, you know that uh, they're not going to plane. Uh, the harder you push them, the deeper that stern digs in. And so we can just tell from that picture that the boat was going just about as fast as it could go. And I know from my own experience in, in owning the boat that um, um, the bow wasn't nearly that far out of the water when you're going 13 knots. So it was going pretty fast. Yeah. It had very large engines when it was first delivered. So yes? So the engines oh. were much bigger. The engines were more powerful and heavier, uh, but they were right in the middle of the boat, so that it doesn't gonna, not going to drag the stern down. But it's just the, um, it's just the, the trough you're plowing through the water. Question. Um, yeah, the question is, uh, uh, what kind of materials uh, did the Stevens brothers use, and, and how did they achieve that, that very fine um, profile that we showed on the, on the uh, Zanzibar, for example, uh, from 1957? Um, Stevens brothers never used any plywood that I'm aware of on the exterior of their boat. Um, I found a little plywood in um, uh, drawers and cabinets and things like that on the interior. But there's no exterior plywood, so that would have all been, um, you know, cut to that curve and, and with planking to to go along with it. So uh, they were um, they were very fine craftsmen. They took a lot of pride in their work, um, uh, used uh, very high grade materials, and the boats were very expensive. Stevens Brothers was the um, was the premier boat builder on the West Coast uh, for all that time, and if you were very wealthy and needed a boat. Um, that's who you went to. Uh, lots of movie stars from Southern California had Stevens boats. I mean, they were really quite sought after. Other questions? Yeah. First of all, thank you for being here. It's a really wonderful, fascinating performance. Um, many years ago, I had a 1959 Hornsby cabin cruiser, and I can't find anything about mm -hmm. that boat. Information about the boat that I couldn't remember. 
Yeah, good. Yeah, good question. The question was, um, the gentleman owns a Youngquist boat previously, previously and uh, wanted to know if um, any of us had any information about where he could find more information about that company and, and those kinds of boats. And um, I would start with the Classic Yacht Association website. There's a, a lot of information about builders there. Um, I'm sure you've looked online, but uh, you can Google it and see what you can find. Um, but um, uh, that's a very good question. That's, as I said earlier, that's one of the challenges that we face with owning these old boats, is trying to track down something about their history and to learn as much as we can about them. So, um, but the other owners in the Classic Yacht Association are you know, a good place to start because um, um, we do this because we're interested in that part of it. Nancy. There's also um, historians from the uh, Eagle Train. Classic Yacht Association. It's just having a competing event tonight. They didn't catch a lot. <laughs> Can I just uh, give Jill a call for the rest of the event? Yeah. And it's uh, August 10th, 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 10th. Okay, that was an answer by the audience. Uh, <laughs> that's fine. Another, another question. So a lot of these classic yachts, have they been re-engined a number of times? Or are they yes, some have, some haven't. Uh, ours um, has been repowered three times. Uh, once in the early 1950s, um, and then again uh, when we owned her in, in 2016. And... Um, but some boats, I know boats that have still have the original engines. I, if we had still had the original engines in the Compadre, I doubt that we would have repowered. We probably would have had them restored and rebuilt and um, so on. But they were long gone. So um, it, 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 it's, um, it's people approach this in a number of different ways. Some folks are interested in these boats because as historical items, much as you would own a classic car, for example. They want it to be as original as possible, and you can find boats that are hardly changed at all from the 1920s or 30s. And those, of course, would have original engines and all of the shortcomings <laughs> that boats from that area, era still had. Um, other folks um, uh, approach it more like we do, where you know, we own the boat because we wanted a boat that we were proud to cruise in. And uh, we've, we've not hesitated to put in um, modern accessories. We have, um, uh, you know, GPS plotter and um, AIS system and radar and um, hot and cold running water and um, diesel forced air heating and lots of comforts. Um, but we've done that in a way that hasn't compromised the design of the boat or um, uh, much of the interior cabinetry and that sort of thing. And you see other people who um, seem to be intent on uh, remodeling and trying to make boats modern. And that usually ends very badly. <laughs> and I, I know of several you know, very nice uh, boats from the 1920s era that were just butchered on the inside by people who thought they were doing a, a service by modernizing them. Um, and so you see a range of approaches, but um, you know we'd like to sort of be there in the middle ground where we've tried our best to keep the boat original, on, especially on the inside, and um, but still make it a comfortable boat to be in. Other questions? Oh, way over here. Um, just with, with you know you talk about all the different aspects of boat ownership. Uh, is there a particular aspect that you enjoy uh, about owning some of these? people who enjoy the engine factor, like people who own Bonnie's boat, or people who've done boat building and enjoy the craftsmanship. Is there a particular aspect uh, that you enjoy uh, specifically? You know, that's a very interesting question. When we bought the boat, 
when we bought Compadre, uh, she had uh, two, um, she had twin Chrysler Crown gasoline engines uh, from the 1950s. And um, I've done a lot of engine work. Uh, I've rebuilt several diesel engines, lots of gas, several gasoline engines as well. Um, and I like to tinker around with those old Chrysler Crowns until they started letting us down in the middle of the Straits of Juan de Fuca or, um, <laughs> or just south of Quadra Island up in, the, um, up in Desolation Sound. Uh, my wife Cindy can describe several instances where we had to limp in on one engine uh, to wherever we were going. Fortunately, we had twin engines and you know, everything redundant. Um, <laughs> And that got old um, after a while. And when we had the opportunity back in 2016, we, we decided that we were going to uh, uh, repower with these y new Yanmar diesels, which has just been um, a remarkable change. It's, it's literally changed the way we use the boat. We were, we were very reticent often of going into areas where we would be in trouble if one of the engines died in a narrow little passageway or something. Uh, we don't hesitate that way much anymore. And so it's, it was, a very expensive thing to do, but um, it's increased the enjoyment immensely. Um, this is a very long answer to your simple question. Um, I, I frankly like to varnish. I, mean, I know I'm in the minority, <laughs> but um, <laughs> if it weren't for the fact that you have to put on eight or nine coats. Um, but it's one of those tasks that you can see the immediate result of, right? Um, it's not like replacing 13 pairs of, of uh, frames and floor timbers that nobody ever sees. Um, at least with a, a, a new varnish job, you have something, uh, something to show for it. And I, I just like tinkering around with boats and, and I do all of my own work except the structural work. And so, you know, I've done plumbing, electrical, electronics, you know, the whole business. And I, I still enjoy that. And when I, when I stop enjoying it, I think that's when we'll move on to something else. Nancy, did you have a question? No, no, you were just thinking that you like to do <laughs> boat work as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, some of these boat owners here in the audience uh, don't share my passion for varnish. <laughs> All right. You know, I, I knew we couldn't get through the entire evening without that question, because that is the question, isn't it? Isn't it? Yes, I used to, uh, I used to be, uh, a fan of uh, Interlux Schooner. Uh, it has a very uh, golden color and I uh, used it for many, many years. I've um, gotten away from that now and I use Pettit Flagship. And I like it because um, it doesn't have quite that golden color. It's more of a natural color and uh, um, it shows off the teak, I think, a, a little bit better. And it seems to hold the shine a bit longer. So um, I'm happy with that. But that's the question everybody asks me. <laughs> Uh, anything else? One. Ah, uh, good question. Good question. Um, the original engines that were in the boat were manufactured by Lathrop Company on the East Coast in Connecticut. And they were um, 120 horsepower. They were um, two spark plugs per cylinder. They were very sophisticated. They were an optional engine. Um, the other, the and boats normally would come with Scripps engines, which were a common marine engine of the day. Um, the Lathrop engines were not ever very common. Uh, I know of one. I've only seen one that wasn't running here um, in the Seattle area. But they were mammoth. They were 1,300 pounds each, and you had two of them. Um, and unfortunately, I never saw them, but they took up uh, an enormous space in, in the engine room below the um, wheelhouse. Um, so, but they had massive amounts of torque. So you saw in that old photograph that the boat was just plowing along like that. And I don't think we could get the boat to do that today. Um, today we have twin Yanmar diesels. They're 80 horsepower each. And they push the boat at maximum speed of 13 knots, faster than we need to go. We cruise at nine and that's very luxurious. And um, you know, they're very economical to run. So lots of changes have occurred in engine technology over, <laughs> over the last 90 years, uh, mostly for the good. Although uh, when I made the decision to repower with these, um, 
we, we couldn't buy a, a conventional diesel engine any longer. They had to be um, these new varieties that are all electronically controlled, which is fine. Um, you know, there's lots and lots of experience with electronically controlled engines in automobiles, diesel cars and diesel trucks. But um, everything is fine as long as the electrons go where they're supposed to go, right? But if you're, up in, if you're up in Princess Louisa or Desolation Sound or farther north and um, one of these engines conks out, it's not a matter of getting in there and troubleshooting it. There's nothing you can do. You have to get on the phone, have the technician fly in with his computer and, and troubleshoot it. So as marine engines go, um, they make me nervous. Uh, we have almost 1,000 hours on them now. So I, I think if something were to go wrong, it probably would have happened already. But um, you know, it makes me a little nervous compared to the old days when uh, these you know, mechanical fuel injection was the order of the day. And um, when those engines fail, there's only two possible problems. You know, it's not getting enough air or it's not getting enough fuel. There isn't anything else. So uh, those are pretty easy to troubleshoot, even if you're out in the middle of nowhere. When you repowered the boat, did you um, replace the, the fuel tank? No, we didn't. Um, the fuel tanks had been replaced um, not long before we bought the boat. I would say probably in maybe the year 1999 or 98. Um, and they did a very nice job. So we pulled them out and cleaned them up and, um, and put them back in again. And how many gallons of fuel does the boat Not very much. Uh, uh, we have twin tanks and they're each 65 gallons. So um, by modern standards, that's a very small amount. But the engines um, don't use much fuel. They, they burn about maybe a total of four gallons an hour between the two of them. So uh, we can go quite a ways. So it's better than it was with the gasoline engines where you know, I had trouble getting from here to, to, uh, to uh, British Columbia. <laughs> okay, um, anything else? I think we'll wrap it up at this point. Um, I, I do want to encourage you to come down and, and visit us on the boats. So um, if you have time, please do that. And anyway, thanks for taking the time to come tonight. And thanks for the Center for Wooden Boats for having us. Thank you.